system. Okay, thank you for introduction and thank you for inviting me here. So I can, I can present you the results of our latest development in this field. Um, yes, I'm from your constellation source and I'm going to present you today our new project called Easy Diffraction, a new easy to use software for analysis of diffraction data. But before I switch to the description of this project, let's um, have a very brief introduction on different scattering techniques. Uh, beams of neutrons, X-ray and electrons interact with material by different mechanism. Uh, here you can see the schematic view of the crystal structure, its surface and position of nuclei. And then now we can see also the electron clouds around nuclei. And electron beams interact with electrons inside material electrostatically. As you can see here, um, those are charged particles and they are not very suitable for bulk studies. Uh, another type is X-ray radiation. It also interacts with electrons, but the interaction is now electromagnetic. And these interactions are also strong, but even X-rays, X-ray beam, doesn't penetrate matter very deeply. Um, and heavy atoms scatter better than light atoms. So those atoms with many electrons and um, large uh, atomic number. And in the case of neutrons, uh, they now interact with atomic nuclei, as you can see here. Um, this type of interactions are very short range and strong because of strong nuclear forces. Uh, you can, the neutrons can penetrate matter much more deeply compared to X-ray and electrons. And beside this, neutrons can interact with unpaired electrons. So as you can see here, this type of interactions between magnetic moment of neutron and magnetic moment of unpaired electrons if rise to magnetic scattering. While with uh, interact with nuclear, you get the nuclear scattering. And neutrons have kind of random dependency of atomic number. So um, elements which are close to each other can have quite a different neutron scattering lens. And there is also dependency on isotopes. So this gives rise to some advantages on neutrons. And, and on this slide, you can see the development of neutron sources over the past like 100 years. Uh, that uh, x axis is year and this axis is an effective neutron flux. The classical research in neutron sources are fission reactors. So they are shown here in orange. And they have reached the technical limits as far as neutron flux is concerned. But there is an alternative way with many advantages, so-called spallation, which is the base for the spallation sources. And at some point, they uh, become more powerful compared to the reactor sources. And this neutron source here, called ESS, the European Spallation Source, is a new generation facility of neutron spallation sources, which is under construction and installation in Lund. Now you can see the digital model of ESS. 
uh, that's how it should look like when everything is completed. So Bloom is somewhere here. That's uh, Synchrotron Max 4. This part is uh, ESS, this accelerator, experimental holes. That's a uh, science village between the And now you can see the uh, design of European Spallation Source. The facility design and construction includes a powerful uh, linear proton accelerator here. So proton beam hits the target here, the heavy and large tungsten target and spallation processes in the target produce neutrons. And there are uh, more than 20 instruments uh, to be constructed and installed uh, around this target in different experimental holes, like experimental hole one, two, and three. And then neutrons, neutron beam hits a sample as shown here, uh, hits a sample and detectors register the neutron scattering, giving precise information about the material structure and dynamics. Um, while ESS is under construction in Lund, uh, the ESS data management and software center DMSC is located in Copenhagen. We develop software for all the steps in the data processing workflow, starting from instrument control, data reduction, analysis, and so on. You can find more information about ESS and our center um, online at ess.eu, it's a link. Now, a variety of techniques can be used to probe structure. To a certain extent, the method of choice depends on the length scale of structure to be investigated. To study bacteria and crystalline grain structures with length scales from 10 to the minus 3 meters down to 10 to the minus 7 meters, optical and electron microscopy can be used. Microstructures down to 10 to the minus uh, nine uh, meters can be studied with small angle scattering. And last week, you uh, had a presentation of SASView software, which can help you to analyze this type of uh, data. And for smaller structures, for atomic structures down to 10 to the minus 11 meters, uh, diffraction techniques are used already. And this part, easy diffraction software can be used to analyze the diffraction data. And now you can see this nice picture from neutron scattering chapter. Uh, illustrating the neutron diffraction process. And that's a neutron man, which personifies a neutron's dual nature, exhibiting wave and particle properties. And here it enters a crystal lattice as a plane wave, interacts with a, a crystal shown in green atoms here and then becomes through interference effect an outgoing plane wave. This direction dictated by Bragg's law. And then uh, it's absorbed in by helium atoms in neutron detectors, for example, and thus we measure its density, time of light, and so on. Um, so before we continue, let's 
uh, have a look on different steps in the data processing workflow in your experiment. So you would start your experiment uh, in X-ray and neutron diffraction with collecting your raw experimental data. And maybe just uh, record one dimensional neutron diffraction pattern or collect um, images from uh, two dimensional position, detect position detector. And then you need to apply some corrections. You might want to reduce your two dimensional data into one D neutron diffraction pattern. The next step would be to compare your experimental data with your um, simulated diffraction pattern based on your model. And then you might need to archive your data or add it to the data catalog and so on. So easy diffraction covers this step, data analysis. And why we started to uh, develop a new software for diffraction data analysis? Uh, of course, in the field of diffraction, there are already a number of programs available, such as Poolproof, Yana, GSAS, Shalix, commercial software, Topaz, and so on. But there are a number of disadvantages, especially for us as a new source. None of the existing software covers all the functionality we need at ESS. So the end user would need to work with different software, depends on the um, technique, type of diffraction technique they use. Uh, another problem is usability. Um, most of the existing software packages are not user-friendly and not intuitive. And that creates a large entry barrier, especially for newcomers. And another point is maintainability. Those packages are often created by scientists as one person project. They are not sometimes open source and difficult to maintain. So our idea was to rely on existing libraries instead of existing programs, such as CRISFML, it's a crystallographic Fortran model library developed at ILL, uh, a base of well-known full prof program, CRISPY, a new library, Python library developed at LLB, CCCBX, a crystallographic library for macromolecular crystallography, and so on. And in this case, we could uh, use several libraries to cover all the functionality we need. Uh, we would create an intuitive and user-friendly graphical interface on top of that to communicate with different libraries. And we are doing this following the best practices in software development. It's an open source project uh, publicly available on GitHub. So the solution concept diagram would look like that. Um, so we choose whatever library we need. For example, this Chris, new CRISPY Python library, CRISFML Fortran library, and in principle, any other libraries uh, we need. Then we create a unified Python API on top of that. And the end user will be able to uh, run calculations in those libraries via the same unified interface from plain Python scripts or using Jupyter notebooks or from graphical user interface. And if we need another technique, we could just implement the support of another library 
and then the user would still have the same unified interface to run those calculations. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is diffraction is currently covers just those three parts because we have just started to work on, on this uh, project last year. Some of uh, the features of easy diffraction. Uh, again, it's a free and open source project. Uh, we distribute it for different platforms, Mac OS, Windows, and uh, main Linux distributions. Uh, it is distributed as all in one package and everything is included. Uh, all the dependencies, all the libraries, there is no more need to add environmental variables or install something separately. You even don't need your system uh, Python to run it. Uh, the user interface is based on user experience and uh, intuitive tab interface. The project files are based on human readable syntax, star format, and CIF dictionary. Uh, it's a crystallographic information file with specification of International Union of Crystallography as much as possible. Um, it's uh, multifunctional in terms of it now supports just a single library, CRISPY. That's why this item here is orange, not green. But we are going to add the support of other libraries as well. And currently it covers just one-dimensional, unpolarized and polarized neutron powder diffraction data measured with constant wavelengths, but we are working on implementation of other techniques. Now, if we get back to this analysis step, it also can be split up in sub smaller sub-steps. Uh, you would usually start with a description of your sample. Uh, in this case, you describe your crystal structure your parameters of your unit cell, atomic coordinates, uh, atomic displacement parameters, and your symmetry, and so on. The next step would be to add your experimental uh, data and instrumental parameters, such as for constant wavelengths experiments, wavelengths, zero offset, uh, instrumental resolution function, and so on. Then you would actually uh, fit your uh, experimental data to the calculated curve, created based on the parameters described here on those two steps, and varying those parameters, you try to find the best agreement between the simulated curve and experimental data. So you are trying to minimize this difference between simulation and experiment, thus obtain the best parameters. Then you might want to create a report of the work you've done. And even before the sample description, you would create like a project structure and, and add it to project and this data analysis workflow is uh, implemented in this state to the easy diffraction um, so as you can see here that's a toolbar of easy diffraction with all those steps, project, sample, experiment, analysis, and summary as buttons. So you can switch from one tab or one page in, within the application to another. So the data 
analysis process is uh, split it up into smaller steps plus one more step at the very beginning it's a home page in addition you've got uh, several buttons on the left and right side like application properties possibility to save the state of your project and do and redo here on the left side you've got the main window uh, where you can see uh, the in this case for the analysis tab, the comparison of your measured data in blue and your calculated data in red, the background curve, position of break peaks, and the difference curve. And you can see it in a visual form or switch to another tab here to see it as a plain text description. At the bottom, you've got the status bar with some essential parameters like goodness of feed, number of feed parameters, number of experiment data blocks and phases. And on the right side, you've got the sidebar with the, all the controls for the main window. In this case, for analysis tab, you've got the list of parameters you will be able to refine their values, units, uh, standard deviations, and you could select which parameters you want to feed. And it also has two tabs for the basic controls, the most essential ones, and advanced controls for experienced users. And every tab here would have its own uh, lower part. Now, a few words about a uh, project file. It's uh, based on crystallographic information file standards. And the project is again split into several files. For every step, you get its, your own uh, file. For project, you have this project.zip. It's just a description of your project, the name of your project, keywords, um, pass to samples, experiments, and calculations. Then the next one is sample, samples.cif. Uh, that's nothing else as a standard crystallographic information file, how you can find it on many. Uh, online di databases, crystallographic databases. Uh, you've got the name of your uh, data block, then the description of a space group according to the international uh, tables of crystallography, parameters of your unit cell, A, B, and C. Some of them are not shown here for simplicity. Then you've got a kind of table with uh, atomic coordinates and other parameters. So e every line here is a kind of uh, title for the column in your table. So that's a label, a type symbol. Those three columns are X, Y, and Z coordinates. A Q on C, atomic displacement parameter type and its value and so on. Uh, next file is uh, experiments.cif where you describe uh, your experimental data. Those three columns are measured to theta, uh, scattered angle, intensity, and standard deviation, plus some instrumental parameters like wavelengths, offset, instrumental resolution parameters. We use the same syntax as in the sample stiff as much as possible. And finally, you get the calculations.cif with uh, calculated parameters. Now you can find the latest version of easy diffraction on its web page 
it's easy to find just easy diffraction in one mode.org where you could download it for different platforms as you can see here mac os windows and major linux distributions you can find some documentation uh, how to what is this needed for how to install launch and uninstall easy diffraction description of its user interface project files and all the steps in the data analysis workflow you can even find uh, some video tutorials on how to install create the project and so on and of course you we have also a get in touch form and we are happy to hear any feedback from anyone um, about how easy or not easy it is to use this software, uh, which features you would like to have in this software. Maybe you would be able to contribute to this software to um, implement a new technique which is currently not implemented. So we would be happy to hear from you. The source code of this program is available on GitHub on the version control. Um, then just easy diffraction. And nine, now kind of a live demo of this software. So you can then download it from easydiffraction.org. It's for the same what I have already told you. Just click this button, one of those buttons, and download the software. Then it is quite easy to install the software. You just need to run installer, select installation folder, uh, does in few clicks, uh, software is installed, and then you can run it. And how it looks like if you started from the, for the first time, this introduction animation can be switched off. And uh, now this home page uh, has yeah, by the way, we have some built-in user guides, uh, those small orange windows to highlight some essential points in the software and guides you through the software how to, how to do this data analysis if you just started for the first time. Here, for example, you can find the links to the online resources like video tutorials, online documentation, get in touch form. Yeah. Now you can open online documentation and contact us. That's application preferences. Now you could start your simulation when you just uh, go to this page. Uh, there is no project yet, so you need either to open an existing project, create a new one, or Click one of those buttons to load the examples as given here. So let's say we want to create a new project. Just disable those user guides. So you can create a new project, specify its name, define its title. And then, as you can see, samples and experiments are not uh, information about the sample and experiment. It's not described or not loaded yet, so we need to do this. So we go to the next step, and at this step, we import uh, the sample description. As you can see here, it's just a plain text description, a CIF file with your crystal structure. So when this crystal structure is loaded, you can already see 
here as a simple viewer of the crystal structure. You can do some basic stuff. And if you switch to another tab, the sample.tif, you can see the content of this TIF file. There's a data block, parameters, and the same information can be accessed here on the sidebar, where you can see your symmetry and cell parameters. In this group, atoms, atomic coordinates and occupations in another group, atomic displacement parameters is the next group. So the same information as is presented in TIFF file is also given here on the sidebar, but in just a more convenient way. Now when sample is described, we go to the next step, experiment description. Again, we need to import our data if you have one in TIFF format, like this. This is uh, instrumental parameters and measured data. So those three columns are measured data. You can load it. If you don't have one, you just open a plain or empty uh, experiments.dat file with just three columns, uh, scattering angle, data intensity and standard deviation and the header the header will be created for you by the program so we just open this one and then we can see the measured data we can zoom zoom see this data in table form and again have access to the sex description and again we can see all the parameters like big profile parameters, instrumental resolution function, background, structural phase. So this phase here is the same as here in the samples.cif. So once everything is loaded, like sample and experimental parameters and experimental data, you can actually start your data analysis. On this tab, you can already see on the sidebar the list of all the parameters which are described on the previous steps on the sample and experiment pages. And now you can compare your measured data shown in blue with calculated curve in red and green curve at the bottom is a difference. So now we can see that there is a huge difference between the measured and calculated data. So what you can do, uh, this, per, this lab, um, icon here corresponds to the sample parameter and this one here corresponds to the experiment parameter. And now you could just click on any parameter, change its value and see in how your simulated curve changes so we could compare it with your measured data. Now we can see that the background is completely different. So in our case it's just 10, in that case it's about 900. So we can change this value manually and see. So now we've got a better description. The wavelengths is also different. The experimental wavelength was 2.4 angstrom. So now we can see it's a little bit better. You can also play with those parameters using this si uh, slider at the bottom. So just change this value here and you can see how it influences your simulated curve. So now when you play with it, you might want to uh, refine those parameters. So allow program to automatically find the best parameters to have the, the best agreement between the calculated and measured curve. And in this case, you just select whatever parameters you want in the sidebar. You just click on these checkboxes, what you want to refine 
atomic, some atomic coordinates for oxygen, the very uh, uh, cell lines A, it's a single parameter for cubic system. And you can see this blinking button on top saying that something, uh, some analysis processing. And when this is done, you see some results. And as you can see, something went wrong. So we have, we have a even worse description of our uh, measured data. But in this case, you can always undo uh, your refinement with this button on the top right corner, or you can undo even single change of parameters. So let's undo it, get back to the previous step. So maybe we don't need, we shouldn't allow to refine too much parameters at, at once. And that's advanced controls. Um, up in the sidebar, we could do some additional stuff. And now uh, you can see, yeah, now we have a better agreement. So we refined a few parameters. Now we want to refine some more parameters again. Uh, and on this tab, you can see the results of refinements, the position of the HKLs and the intensities. During the refinement, you could go from one tab to another. When the refinement is done, you can see that we have a better agreement, but still uh, our calculated curve is higher than the experimental one. So we might need to add a few more, just one more background points. So we just got two of them. You can go to this experiment, see if at one more point at 80 degrees. And when we go back to the analysis tab, this point is added. And if you put brackets, it's in the plain text description. It's the same as to allow this parameter to be refinable. And we start new refinement with small background points and also refine some resolution function parameters. And now, and this is done, you can see that it's always much better. So you have quite reasonable agreement already between your measured data and experimental curve. And then when the refinement is done, you go to the last step summary, where you can see this uh, report created for you, the description of the project, uh, with a table of parameters. You can save this report as HTML or PDF. The same as here. And this button allows you to save the current state of the project. Uh, so you can also you can always open existing project. For example, uh, this would be just a folder with all those CIF files in it, and you select just the project.cif. You open it, and that's your project. Your project description, some images associated with this project. Or you can open the project which is zipped. That's the project we started from. Or you can choose one of those examples here. So a single click, you open a new example and you can play with it. Now you can see the polarized Newton diffraction data analysis. up, plus down, up, minus down intensities and so on. 
and you can save. So if, if you change something in your project and the data is not saved and you want to close the application, just informs you that something is not saved. So that's basically the was a demonstration of the application and just at the end a few words about further development. So we started with implementation of just one library, CRISPY, but even in this case there are still parts which are not implemented into graphical user interface. So we are going to add those missing things and we are going to implement a new CRISFML library, the base of it's a well-known full-proof program for diffraction data analysis. In this way, we are going to cover uh, missing techniques like time of flight, single crystals, data analysis, X-rays, data analysis. On the analysis part, we are going to implement constraints and multiple phases and multi support of multiple phases and multiple data blocks. Also implement automatic updates when new version of the program is released and automatic save of project files when you work with this with this user project and much more. And so we would be happy to hear from you your feedback and you can contact us for example yeah, easydiffraction.org contact form. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Hello. Okay, thank you very much. And during your talk, actually, we received many questions. So I hope you're happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we can start step by step. Um, the first question is, Indication of timeline for additional functionalities such as top neutron data and combined data sets refinements. So that's the first question. Uh, sorry, could you please repeat the question? Indication of timeline for additional functionalities such as top neutron data and combined data set refinement. When they will be available. When they will be available. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah, it's a difficult question. It's a good and a difficult question. So um, the point we just started uh, with this project last year. So we have a, a first kind of first release with just the limited functionality. And now we are collaborating with um, other facilities as we have limited resources. We're collaborating with other facilities. Uh, to implement CRISFML library. This is a library developed at ILL. And this library covers many aspects like time of flight and X-rays, many, many things. And now they have created the first version of Python binding to this library because the library itself is a Fortran based. So they're creating the Python library binding and we are now trying to see how to Imp uh, implement this client into our graphical user interface. Okay. So we are going to, to try with this in near future. So I think uh, we would have something this year, but I can't mm -hmm. say you the like exactly yeah. this. Also, we, we are working in collaboration with another facility, LLB, uh, to implement the other functionality from CRISPY library. And they are also going to introduce additional functionality to CRISPY. For example, time of flight data is not possible yet to calculate in CRISPY, but they are also going to add this. So we are trying to, uh, to collaborate with different facilities and thus um, make it faster. Yeah, in order to make this possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, because then there is like a second question, maybe it can be connected, right? So would it be possible to load the GSAS and full prof PCR flies into easy diffraction? Uh, we already have requests to add support or uh, allow easy diffraction to import data from other programs like GSAS and or full prof. Uh, we are going probably to add something, but not uh, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in this case, it, it's kind of complicated. Because every so external software and other software depends on their own formats. So, and we would need to support all different formats and follow the changes of the, that format if something is changed on another. Uh, programs. On the other hand, you can already now imp uh, import TIFF format and yeah, TIFF okay. file, mm -hmm. at, at least for the sample description, can be generated by other uh, packages like FullPro, for example, or uh, YANA. So we could generate this and then import this TIFF file, import your data, and manually change those parameters. Mm. But in principle, yes, people would like to have better support uh, and easier transition from one software to another. So maybe at some point, we would also introduce a possibility to import other formats. Okay, then there is someone in the audience, Pascal Manuel, that would like to ask you directly some questions. So yeah. maybe we unmute. Pascal Manuel, and we give you the word. Uh, hi, Andrew. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, hi, Pascal. So, hi. Um, so thanks for the talk. Uh, there's some nice features there, like uh, seeing real time what the parameters do to your thing. But the the example is like uh, so far very simple. So it's hard to know whether to go. Pascal, we are having issues with the yeah. microphone. Yeah, so there are interruptions. So Can you please I, repeat your question, Pascal? Because there were some interruptions in the connection. So yes, your microphone. How are you working with it? Yeah, so there are interruptions. In yes. So How many people are working on this? Currently, <laughs> there are just a few of us, uh, two, three uh, person who uh, currently work on the uh, development of easy diffraction. I but would say, we, Pascal, we, if you have more questions yeah. or if you have detailed questions, because we have connection problems, uh, yeah. Maybe you can type them, you can write them, and then we yeah. can uh, address uh, we, them to the speaker. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add that uh, we would be happy to collaborate with other facilities. Uh, so to, to, to faster implement all the features to have this intuitive mm -hmm. interface available at different places. And there are uh, interests uh, at some universities about is a diffraction so you might have a student or phd student to contribute to this to implement something so we would be happy to collaborate with everyone it's an open source project and everyone would be in uh, yeah. okay. very good so there is a very long specific question so i believe maybe i can just share it with the speaker and uh, I can uh, just read it, uh, or maybe you can just share it with everyone so that also the other uh, people in the audience can read it themselves. So, it's a specific question about Lorentz correction uh, for simulating diffraction patterns. Uh, can you read it? Can you see it, Andrew? Uh, no, I don't see anything. On the message, uh, on the chat panel. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll ask out. So a specific question about the uh, Lorentz correction for simulating diffraction patterns. 
in the literature Lorentz factor is uh, 1 by sine 2 theta for monochromatic beam diffraction while Lorentz factor is 1 by sine uh, theta square for low diffraction using wide beam. Are these two Lorentz correction always holds in uh, corresponding conditions? In some cases it's found that taking Lorentz factor 1 by sine 2 theta is in better match with experimental data for diffraction using wide beam which seems contradictory your thoughts uh, well that's a kind of really specific question so i would be happy if you contact me or any other in our group so we can discuss it in more details but in principle i just want to say that this software is uh, based on the existing and new libraries for crystallographic data analysis, for diffraction data analysis, and all the corrections and everything which is needed on the analysis step are done there through those uh, libraries. So we don't develop uh, a new library for the calculations. We develop a new interface to communicate with the existing libraries. And so all the mass, all the things are, are there. And but anyway, just feel free to contact us if you uh, have some specific questions like that. Great. Yes, exactly. As you said, we always uh, reply to the to the audience. They can uh, directly contact the speakers uh, via email if they have specific questions. But now Pascal uh, wrote. Uh, uh, his questions uh, that again we are trying to uh, share with you Andrew and with the audience um, I will say like uh, hmm, yeah are the R factor given looked like uh, just key chi-square chi -square. Um, can you see correlation between the uh, refrain parameters that's the first question and then it continues with others. Uh, not, yeah, I, I have found uh, this, those questions in the chart. Okay. Uh, so for some moment, um, this, this software, uh, we started as a prototype of graphical user interface. And then step by step, we just decided to have it more interactive to bind with the real library. And then we just add the basic things or something uh, which came to our mind at the very beginning. So many things are not yet there, like our factors are not yet uh, displayed, only uh, his square. Uh, currently, you can't see the correlation between the parameters, but we would, we would like also to add this, uh, uh, this chart, the possibility to see the correlations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Now about replacing full prof. Uh, well, yes, because also, we do. Yeah, is the aim to completely replace the full prof? Uh, I would say, uh, at least not from the beginning. This, uh, from the beginning, uh, simple and intuitive software, uh, which would not be able to cover everything which is currently possible with this full prof, especially if you. Think about the full process, full proof suite where uh, you've got uh, a lot of other uh, small programs to do some stuff, even some data reduction and uh, reducible representation and so on. But uh, so the idea is to have an intuitive interface, uh, especially for newcomers, and the way to work with those libraries via Python interface and Jupyter notebooks. And maybe at some point, it will grow uh, up so it could cover everything which is needed and everything which is covered with full pro. We'll see. Uh, we would like to, to, to extend it as much as possible. And, and the same is this magnetism. Magnetism is not currently yet implemented. It's just mm -hmm. a local susceptibility approach implemented based on, on CRISPI library uh, with uh, uh, local susceptibility tensor, uh, not uh, un not unpolarized Newton diffract, uh, not unpolarized uh, magnetic structure analysis, uh, rigid body uh, stacking faults not 
not yet PDF. There was a request to implement PDF, uh, but for for that we need to bind this GUI with another library for PDF data analysis, and that's again a matter of resources if we find someone or if the um, there is a strong need. We will see a strong need for that. We will work on this. Uh, 2D retrieval uh, refinement is not done, but for 2D retrieval refinement, we need a proper software or pro proper library to calculate this 2D data, which is not available, as I know, anywhere. Uh, there is a 2D data analysis increased by for polarized instant diffraction data. Uh, which we are also going to implement at some point. So okay. there, are, there are a lot of uh, specific questions. Here. Yes, I would say actually, I mean, uh, we, are, we invite Pascal, of course, to uh, have a further discussion with Andrew, uh, but we continue with other questions from the audience. So I think this one is a more general one. So uh, a person in the audience says, uh, so hello. <laughs> I believe that there was a program from all the diffraction-based sources called Mantid. So will they be integrated further into Mantid or it will be standalone? Uh, so Mantid software is a software for this step, data reduction. Okay, great. When the data is reduced, we can then do some data analysis. And that's already uh, this software uh, is a diffraction. So we are not going to have easy diffraction to be a part of, of mindset. We would rather separate as separated here in steps. You have one software for instrument control, another software for data reduction, the next software for data analysis. So we are going to follow this, this logic. Okay. Great. So we could do in the last couple of questions, I will say. So can we do time of flight calculations from the diffraction spectra specifically for different phases of same species? Uh, time of flight is not yet implemented into easy diffraction. But that's one of the, our highest priority because ESS is a spallation source. Yeah. So we need yeah. time of life. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so we just started with some, something which was easier to uh, bind mm -hmm. with our GUI to yeah. improve the GUI, to improve something. Uh, but that's uh, the, the next important main step here. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, Pascal, Manuel, uh, thank you very much for, for the, your answers. And um, we continue with another question. So, is it possible to determine the oxygen vacancy in the magnetic materials uh, from their diffraction spectra? O oxygen, sorry, oxygen what? Vacancy in magnetic materials. So, I mean, in the audience, there might be people that are not familiar at all uh, with the software or the application of well, this. C currently, uh, for magnetic materials, we just support one technique, uh, polarized uh, mm. neutron classical polarized neutron diffraction data, so-called flipping ratio method. Mm -hmm. where, uh, and for this case, on powders, you can get, uh, you can refine the parameters of your magnetic susceptibility tensor on, on your atom. This is possible now. And we are going also to implement single crystal data analysis. So we can do this on powder and single crystals. But the standard uh, analysis of magnetic materials is not yet implemented. And uh, this would be also one of the next steps, uh, either with crystal or CRISPI. Uh, yeah, 